sense that winter has arrived. Yes, we just got back from Florida. I think we're going to turn around and go back down there. It was <laughs> nice down there. We were down in Dick, Ail Dick and Aileen's neck of the woods down there. It's a whole lot nicer. High 70s and 80s. Uh, a lot more. Uh, it's a lot more hospitable. Of course, we got home on Friday, so we had a good day on Friday, and then Saturday things have changed, and obviously it's a different story. I just want to give a couple. I said I've been here for a couple weeks. Um, the the uh, those of you that took your quiz, you should get back your homework. I gave some to you the Wednesday night before I left. That the, your homework should have a little red number up in the corner if you took the quiz. You guys did really well. I think the class average is like 90 or 91. So you guys did extremely well. Several of you did the uh, memory verse. Several of you have not done it yet. So uh, if you, I think if you did the memory verse, you got it right. It'll say your test scores. It'll say I think a plus 25 or a little 25 up in the corner. That means you got the, the memory verse right. So, but you can have next quiz. We'll, in the middle of December, we'll another quiz. You get another shot at it. If you didn't do it, you didn't try it. But uh, what, are, what is our memory verse for this uh, for this quarter? What's the reference? Uh, nope. Yeah. That was the right one. Second Timothy three sixteen. Second Timothy three sixteen, which says what? All Scripture is inspired by God. And that means God breathes, right? It's the Scriptures come from God, and are what? Profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, correction, <coughs> correction. And training. You got it right on the quiz, so you should know this. <laughs> <laughs> training for righteousness, right? Right. Four things. Four things it does for you. The word of God lasts forever. You know, we're experiencing bad weather today, but it's going to pass, right? But God, the word of God's kingdom is going to last forever. So as you're reading your homework lessons, as you're doing your homework, you are doing something that's going to affect your life and really the lives of other people for all eternity because God's word works in us and it works through us as a people. So thank you for all the time and effort that you're putting into this, that it's going to result for you for eternal uh, benefits and blessings. Um, it's interesting, there's only there's two questions. Most of you, most of the questions that you, you did miss were, you, you know, I think you just misread the, 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 uh, uh, the question, or there's a little bit of a discrepancy on the uh, fill in the blanks. It was a little confusing the way you had to use all the words once, but as I look back, it really wasn't worded right. But there were two that kind of stood out that uh, a lot of people missed. And the, the one was, now not a lot of people, but the people that missed it, this is probably missed it four or five times, where it was a true or false question. Again, true or false, I don't like them personally, but they're just easy to grade, and you, you obviously have a 50% chance of getting it right, so it does, it starts you start off on the right foot. But it said, praise and worship are the same thing. No, that's correct, it's not, but I think four or five people said that that's true. And then we talked about, there's a subtle difference, but praise and worship, there are two different aspects of honoring God, so they would not be the same thing. There is, there is a difference, and some people argue that there are subtle differences, but there is a difference. And then the other one was that um, where okay, where are the, the unrighteous people that have already died, people that didn't know the Lord, didn't serve God, never repented, where are they right now? Someone dies now, there's, there's basically two destinations. I always kind of teach when I teach on predestination. I always tell people, I believe in biblical predestination. That God has predestined everybody to know him. But there are two destinations because he gives us the ability to choose, right? We're free moral agents. We're not, we're not robots. Even the angels weren't robots. The angels had the ability to choose. There were a certain amount of angels that disobeyed God, that rejected God, and rebelled against Him. Uh, probably a third, but we only have one verse that talks about that. But uh, there are two destinations. And uh, so people that have passed from this life, you know, we're still alive, we join life, but there's a whole bunch of people on the other side, and they're either, you know, uh, Paul said, as a believer, to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. So those of those of the God on before, they're with the Lord. They're in the Lord's presence right now, and uh, they probably don't miss us near as much as we miss them. I mean, we miss them, but I'm sure they're enjoying themselves. But if you die and you don't know the Lord, the Bible says in Hebrews, you know, that, that 
after death, there's judgment. There's no, no waiting period. You either you know the Lord or you don't. So you either die and you go to heaven, or you die and you go to the Bible calls hell. Now, is hell the final final destination for evil people? It's a fire. No, it's the lake of fire, right? The Bible tells us in, in uh, Revelation, I guess chapter 20, that at some point in time, hell will actually be emptied into the lake of eternal fire. Uh, both bad places. One's kind of a temporary. It's sort of like different between going to jail and going to prison, and one is, one is much more permanent than the other. Any questions about? That's been a couple of weeks ago. Any questions about the quiz? I have. I don't pass them back, but I have. If you ever, if you want to look at yours, I have no problem. I just keep them uh, so they're not recirculated. And sometimes I'll recycle this class through a, a church. And, and when I was in school, we always held on to tests, and you'd pass them on to, or you'd sell them to underclassmen to, you know, to, uh, to hey, I didn't know what was asked of. But any, any questions about the quiz? I know this is kind of ancient history now, but I um, just want to see if there's anything that anybody had questions about that. Very good. Okay, so we're up to, uh, today we're going to talk about stewardship, how you and I are stewards of all that we have. Um, before we do that, though, I would like to review a little bit, because well, it'll be another three, what, three or four weeks, three weeks before we'll have another quiz. But going back three weeks ago, we talked about fasting, right? And uh, you remember what, what, did, what, what these, did we say is kind of an overarching reason for or purpose? Why would we, why do we fast? Why would we voluntarily give up eating that is so precious to us? Obviously, we, you know, if you watch TV, you see food commercials all the time. You, if you go out somewhere, you're always seeing you know, restaurant signs and people are always advertising. So why would we? Why would I willingly deny myself of food for a period of time? That's really what biblical fasting is. We can fast, give up other things. We can give up TV. We can give up the internet for a while. But there's nothing wrong with that. But biblically, fasting talks about abstaining from food for a measured part of time. So why would we do that? Why do we fast? To come closer. Lord and, and to pray. Okay. okay. It makes us more aware of the Lord, too, and of, of his kingdom, right? Especially when our body is screaming, why aren't you feeding me? So I'm saying, well, I'm hungry right now, but what I'm saying is I'm more hungry for the things of God than I am for food. And boy, I'm realizing what a powerful influence food has on me. It's like when you're hungry, you're kind of all consumed with, I want something to eat, you know, and everything. Everything, every, every aroma that you smell, and every time you see a commercial on TV, it just stokes those fires of like, that's right, I'm hungry. So get close to the Lord. Anything else? What, what else does, does, does the Bible say? What, what's a benefit? What's a reason? What's a, why would I traumatize myself? Speaking of God over a different situation in our life or somebody else's situation. I can hear the first part. Seeking God. Seeking God, yeah, yeah, for his wisdom. Does anybody remember what, what, is, what is the kind of the difference? The premier chapter in the Bible. If you want to read about reasons to fast, I mean, there's a lot of different sections of scripture, a lot of verses we can talk about, but there is a chapter in the Bible that talks a lot about it. Anybody remember where that's at? Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah 58. You want to read Isaiah 58? Uh, the first, the first six uh, verses talk about wrong reasons, the wrong ways to fast. You know, we can do anything. We can do something right for the wrong reason. And that no matter how noble something, uh, I can do something, I can do the right thing, but I can do it for the wrong reason. So the first six verses talk about how they were mis, uh, misappropriating fasting. And I think it's verses 6 through 12 or 18 talk about there's just a whole list of here's what happens when you fast unto the Lord. When you do it for Him, when you're trying to honor Him. So it's just an incredible check. It's very encouraging, especially when you're... You're fasting, you got a little headache going on, and you feel a little sluggish, and it's like, why am I doing this? Then you read that and you go, oh, okay, okay, this is why I'm this is why I'm doing this is what's taking place. And it talks a lot of it talks about how it changes our hearts. It changes, you know, we're not fasting, I'm not fasting to change God. Now, I'm not trying to get him to change, you know, change his his mind or change his I'm trying to change me. I'm trying to change the way I see situations, or I'm trying to fasting to help other people change. You know, God doesn't need change. I need change, and other people need to change. So, uh, great benefits there. Okay. And obviously, you know, Jesus said, when you fast, it wasn't wasn't really an option. He <clears throat> wasn't saying, hey, you, know, if you guys feel like it, think about it, when you fast, and he gave us instructions in Matthew chapter 6. Um, 
Communion, what do, what do the elements represent? The next week was on communion. What are, what are the elements in communion? The, 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 the juice and the bread, what do they represent? The body and the blood of Christ. The, the body and the blood of Christ, very good. And uh, what, what, is a, what is a purpose? Why, again, why, do we, why do we celebrate? Why do we uh, recognize? Why do we practice communion here at Water's Edge? What does it do for us? Or what is the purpose? Sharing. What's that? Sharing. Okay. The, the very word communion talks about intimacy, that we're communing with God. It helps develop that intimacy with God and with one another. There's a there's a there's a vertical component to fasting, and then there's a horizontal component to fasting. So good. Anything? Or I'm sorry, communion. What else? What else about communion? What anything? Anything else perfect? Him and what he did. For us, right? Christ and what, what he did for us. First Corinthians 11 says, we do this in remembrance. I tend to forget. I tend to forget how much God has done for me. We're, that's a human. You know, the, the, the old saying is, you know, especially I've heard uh, uh, bosses and <clears throat> of employees say, you know, my, my employees, and they ask, well, you know, what have you done for me lately? Because we tend to forget. No matter how much you do, I remember the fam if you ever heard of Milton Hershey, <clears throat> Hershey's Chocolate in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He was so heartbreaking because he was a man that was a multimillionaire. He'd gone bankrupt a couple times, a multimillionaire, very successful, and uh, but had a real heart for his employees and tried to pay them well and actually provided very affordable, nice housing. If you ever go to those, those yeah. neighborhoods. Yeah. And uh, towards the end, the, the, the workers, I can't remember if they were striking, but they were just, um, they wanted more. And he was really heartbroken because he was a, we know the, the, the tremendous philanthropy he left behind, the Hershey home for, for uh, uh, kids, you know, for the, for the orphans and all kinds, of, all kinds of things. He was so heartbroken and we had to realize that, you know, people, we can't, you and I cannot live our lives to try to please people because people will disappoint us. <coughs> we disappoint ourselves. I disappoint myself. How can, <coughs> how can I not disappoint other people? At one point, it was the half paid uh, people in, in the state of uh, Pennsylvania. I can believe that. I can believe that. And uh, it was greedy that they actually destroyed him. Yeah. Yeah. He was a heartbroken man. I mean, all that he did for his, his employees, how well he treated them. This is way back before unions right. and all the protection. And it was just heartbreaking for him. But again, reminds us, I can't, I can't live to please other people or try to, I mean, I need to, I want to do well to other people, but if they don't receive it, I have to realize I need to do it for him, to honor him, and then he'll take care of all the other stuff. Um, and then last week was the fruit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Why do we say fruit of the Spirit instead of fruits of the Spirit? We don't call them fruits, we call them one source. One source? One tree, one yeah. source. Yeah. And, and how many, how many, how many fruit does it list in that list in, in uh, is that Galatians? Five? Nine, isn't it? Nine. Yeah, yeah. Anybody remember what they are? Love, joy. Love, joy. Peace. Peace. Long suffering. Uh, or, or patience, long suffering. Patience. Gentleness. Kindness. Gentleness. Gentleness. Faithfulness. Right. Faithfulness. In the old, if you go by King James, it says faith. It's really, it's really faithfulness is the, is the word. Two more. Meekness. Meekness and temperance. temperance. Very good. Very good. Now some of those depends on your translation. <coughs> they'll, they'll name them a little differently. It can be kind of confusing. It's, it's good to, to pick, you know, pick a version and memorize it. That and just somebody else starts saying, you go, no, 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 la, 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 la. no, I, I, I memorize it this way. You're messing me up. <laughs> they switch some of the names around. But uh, and I've heard people I, I teach that really there's one fruit. The, the, it's love, and then it has eight different manifestations of that. Yeah, it, could, it could be, it could be. But it is fruit, not fruits, it is fruit of the Spirit. Uh, okay, what else about fruit? Um, how, how does the, uh, how do we develop the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? How, how can that, and I think your lesson is a challenging lesson where you're supposed to go each day of the week, and, and all it's trying to do is make you more aware but how do, how do you and I, you know, when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts God deposits in your life really don't have a whole lot to do with it other than you decide where it's going to manifest. 
God can give you a wonderful prophetic gift, but if you're too afraid to say something in church, too afraid you're going to make a mistake, and I understand that. I'm not, I'm not up here. I'm always, whenever God wants to use me, it's like, oh, I hope this is you. I hope this is you, Lord, because, man, I don't want to. So that, but, but the fruit's different. So how, how does how do, how do the fruit grow? It's like fruit grows and matures on a, on a tree or bush. How does it grow in your life and my life? You have to abide in the body, the true body. Because it's him. Yeah. It's him in me. It's him in you. It's him working through us. I can't, I can't, I can't make the apples. For, you know, it, it has to be the Holy Spirit. That's why all of us, we have to learn to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, hear what the Holy Spirit is saying, say what he's saying, do what he see through, you know, through his eyes. And that's so easy to say, but it's so hard to do. I don't think your fruit grows unless you use it. Yeah. You have to be willing, right? It's like, like a tree, you got to fertilize it, you got to water it, you got to care for it, you got to prune it. Oh, boy, do I hate that. I still remember the first time we moved to State College where my wife is from, and they had a Harner fruit farm, and they had all these uh, apple trees. They had an orchard. And I remember the first time, I, I'm sure I've seen them before, but I just saw that it's on the main road, you see all these rows, and I said, those trees look pathetic. They look, and my, when I grew up, we had an apple tree in the backyard, and it was huge, and it was a ginormous, it had branches and apples, and I thought it was ridiculous. Now look at those, they look, they look, they look like they're deformed or something. They don't take care of them. But they were they had been pruned to produce the most fruit. That's part of the process. You get rid of all the little, the elongated you know, tomato, little sucker leaves and stuff. You get rid of things that take away. You want it all going to the fruit. So they look terrible <coughs> until they start producing fruit. And that's what happens in, in our lives when God begins to prune us. We begin to go, God, what, what, what are you doing? This hurts. And other people begin to look at you and think, well, you're, I thought you were spiritual. How come, what the fruit that you're going through in life? And all the while, God's just to me. And I'm going ouch, and I don't like that. I'd, I'd rather look, I would rather look nice and pretty to other people. But God's seeing the eternal aspect of our lives begins to prune us, and that helps the fruit to develop better. All right, any questions before we get into stewardship today about fruit of the Spirit, communion, fasting, last few weeks? Very good. Okay, today we're looking at Christian stewardship. And if you didn't, you should have ever seen the last three lessons I passed out to every one of you when got for the next few weeks. So there'll be our last three lessons for the three lessons for this quarter. And uh, then we'll be done for the Christmas break. All right, so we're looking at Christmas, uh, Christian stewardship. Um, not a word that's used a lot in our, our culture, society. You know, I hear a lot of people talk about um, being a good steward. That's kind of a churchy word. What would be a more contemporary word than being steward or a good steward. How, how, how would we describe that to people outside the church that aren't familiar with that church and terminology? Good caretaker. Caretaker? Okay. Anybody else? What is a steward? Mm -hmm. you know, a teacher. What's that? Teacher. Teacher? Uh, could be. Because you are uh, They're a steward of those, of those children. Yes, okay. they are. What about what about manager? Yeah. Does that be more of the word? Yeah. A, a manager, maybe even a supervisor, whatever you want to call it. Somebody that holds accountability. Yeah. And the key is, I remember back when I was a, back in the, in the dark ages, when I was in college, I worked as a I worked in a restaurant, I worked as a manager. Actually, the guy that I worked for, his son, you know, you know him, or you know of him, because he owns all the Panera. Panera in, in, Ohio and I forget where he's the biggest, I think he's the biggest franchisee or whatever they call that. He owns Panera and, and you know Charlie's. You ever been to know Charlie? Yeah. He owns them. That's uh, Sam Cabello, his dad, and I, I worked for Sam and his dad was Al Cabello. But anyway, they had a whole bunch of restaurants up in Warren, in Jackson County, where I'm from. 
and I worked and you know, went to school. I've been a manager for them for several years, and uh, you know, so when I was managing my shift, I was in charge. You know, I, I you know, was coordinated everything. We had a very, very busy, uh, uh, busy restaurant, but you know what? I knew. I, I didn't own this place. I knew it wasn't mine. You know, we had different delivery vendors would come in, and I had to make decisions, do stuff. But I always knew this was not my store. I was responsible for you know whether opening or closing and and you know counting the, the deposits and all that kind of stuff. But but I never thought, of, oh, this is my money. I always do. This belongs to Mr. Cabellis. He's the owner. He owns this restaurant. I'm just a manager, and that's the way we need to focus on our lives. Is that my life? belongs to God. Now, I don't, not everybody acknowledges that or honors that, but if you're a believer, you have to understand that I am really a steward of all that I have, and God has given all of us different gifts. You know, some of us are, some of us are strong. You know, we're strong physically, uh, or we're strong emotionally, we're strong mentally, whatever. We're strong. God has made us strong, but made you strong to be a help to those who are your weak. But some people use their strength to take advantage of it, right? Or the bully. We can all remember back being in school when there was a big, strong kid and he was a big bully or whatever. Uh, so we can take a gift God has used for the good and use it for wrong reasons, use it for selfish reasons. Maybe God may have given uh, you great wisdom and uh, great knowledge. And again, to help some people, to start as wise. You're there to help counsel people, direct people, to support people when they make mistakes. But we can use that in the wrong way. I remember years ago reading an article about the FBI's top 10, you know, you ever see those uh, pictures of the top 10 uh, criminals, top 10 most wanted. And it was interesting that when you read the background of those criminals, not all of them, but the vast majority of them have an extremely high IQ. And some of them are actually geniuses. And when you think of some of the things that some of these people have done, Illegally, it would take a genius mind to figure that out, you know. So some of those guys are—they're not dumb; they're really smart. You know, anybody can try and do a crime and get caught, but if you can do big crimes and not get caught, that you're pretty—you're pretty smart. And some of the great heists where money's been stolen, and now where they do it electronically, but it takes a lot of intellect to do that. Here's somebody that's incredibly smart, but they're using it for a bad reason, the wrong reason. The same way some of us are, are gifted financially, either in, in making sums of money or, or managing our money. And again, it's not to hoard it for ourselves, it's really to help other people. So we are a steward of all that God has given us. And uh, the more we understand that, the more it takes some of the pressure off of us when bad things happen. We're like, hey, I'm living for God. All I have belongs to him anyway. It's all going to go back to him. I'm not going to take anything with me someday. So I just want to be a good steward of what I have while I'm here. We have four different accounts, um, some scriptural uh, sections of scripture I'm going to have us take a look at that, that go along with this stewardship principle. And the first one is from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. It's called the, you Bible will have a little caption, will say the parable of the fool. But uh, uh, Jack, would you read that for us from Luke 12? Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to him, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, fought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? And so is he who lays up treasure for himself, not rich for God. I two stories. One is where someone comes to Jesus, hey, you know, my, my, my brother, he's not, he's not doing right by me. He's not he's, he's taking advantage of me. And, and uh, 
how about you, you know, you intervening, making this right? Uh, the other story is about uh, the person doing very well and doing so well that he's got to he's got to build bigger storage facilities because of all his stuff that he has. What what is it? What are these? Why are these? They're obviously in the Bible for us. You know, uh, remember, the Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us, right? You know, there was a book of Corinthians. There was a church of Corinth. So that that letter was to them, but it's for all of us. Okay, so why in Luke, the, the, this Gospel of Luke, why why are these two stories included? What what does it say to us to you and I here today? These two stories, how they apply? How they apply to us? For me, the first, uh, first uh, yep. is a uh, brother that the inheritance. Like me, I, I went, when I, I went up to Seattle to see my father. He moved from us. And, uh, when I went, went up to 78, and he, and uh, he kicked me out. Then I left there and went back in 88 when he died on Thanksgiving Day. I, um, I went up there to bury him. But uh, something in me, I didn't know God at the time, something told me to go there. He was a science Christian Scientologist yeah, oh, in, yeah. in the Mason. And so when I went there, I didn't know he was that. So we're, that, we're that, related? You're not related? <laughs> and uh, when, uh, when I got there, I didn't know he was all that until I got, yeah. got there and meeting uh couple of his friends from the church and, and the condo he was staying in. And um, learning about him and everything, and then I found out he had a little money and he had jewelry and this and that. He, he owned the condo and all that huh? stuff. So my other oldest brother was with me. He got there, he said, Dan, I don't know that man. He left us in 55. He was only two, two and a half, maybe. I was four, four and a half. I don't know that man. He don't mean nothing, I don't him nothing. So I'm going back home. So he left Seattle, Washington to come back here. He didn't see the man. Uh, the next day I went down to the police state, uh, to the morgue to yeah. see the body and view the body and everything. And prior to me getting there, I uh, set up a funeral, uh, his, uh, funeral home and this and that, a grave site and everything. But uh, he left there and I didn't, uh, what I, I sold the car, no furniture and everything, gave away most of the furniture, gave away most of his clothes, but uh, the jewelry and this and that clothes all his bank account. I didn't have to come back to Columbus and set, uh, divide the money between my oldest brother and my other brother, Alvin, that went with me, yeah. and my sister. I didn't have to divide the money between the four of us, mm -hmm. but I did. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know why. <laughs> right, right, I was, uh, right after I did it, I, 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 right after that, why did I, I do that? What was I thinking? Uh, right after that, I said, you fell good. What I was looking at from them was uh, expecting from them they never gave me. They never said, good job, Dad, thank you. Pat, you patted me on the back, shook my hand. They never said that. All three of them are dead now. My, my my oldest brother just died last uh, a year ago this year, July, mm -hmm. and my other brother Alvin the Whitman Whitman Hughes died in '06. And my sister Barb, the one younger than me, she died in '03. Uh, so you know, wow. none none of them said sorry, Dan. Uh, thank you, Dan. None of them, mm -hmm. and I I wanted that. I was I, I, that that would have helped him more than anything. Sure. But I gave them this and that, I've divided it, and this and that, gave, gave some jewelry, necklace to my sister, rings and this and that. I did that. And, you know, it hurt me. It hurt me for a long time. And, to, and during that time, I was drinking alcohol, mm -hmm. drugs, and, but I want to make the long story short, I, by the inheritance, I did what I needed to do, but I didn't know it, it was, I didn't have to do it. Yep. And I did it. Yep. And the, the judging, me judge, I judged them. Yeah. I did she judge them. Either. And, 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 and I, didn't, uh, I didn't understand <coughs> why, well I knew why, but I, I was looking for something from them and they didn't give me. Yep. So I, I judged them. Yep. But I, I'm, I'm getting back to the pruning part, yep. yeah. and that's what the Lord did for me. I, he pruned me, yep. uh, but I wasn't with the Lord at the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my question to everybody, can God do that without you doing God? Mm -hmm. Can he prune you for a particular yes. 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 thing yes. without yes. you knowing God, yes. accepting God in your life? Yes. Can yes. he still prune you? Because, <laughs> like uh, you know, the, by me seeing and reading this, uh, when, we, uh, when Jack was reading, and I said, Jack, well, that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to the, right here, what I got, uh, the, the right of the first one is, <coughs> the right of the first one was a double portion of, a, of inheritance, Deuteronomy 21, 17. Perhaps this man wanted an equal share in any any <coughs> case. Jesus seemed unconcerned about the implied, implied impatience and injustice and refused the man's request to uh, arbitrate the family dispute. <coughs> I could have made a Come, come, come yeah. over that. But I didn't die that right. for long. Does, it, does anybody know that? <coughs> this is this is kind of off the subject, but when it talks about the the inheritance in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. where the the oldest would get a double portion. Do you guys recall that? I mean, you read that in different areas. But does anybody know why why that is? It's just because hey, if you're the firstborn, yeah, we get double we anybody else. Yes. <laughs> yes. Anything else? I was thinking because it says to get the first of your crops <coughs> away, right. so maybe the firstborn. Right. Well, the first the firstborn got now he didn't get. I'm trying to think, he, if there was a, if there was say there was there was a, I'm trying to think how to do this mathematically would make sense. He didn't get double, and then everybody else divide up the other half. He got if there were. If there were three sons, let's say there were three siblings in a family, they would divide the inheritance four ways, so it would be four parts, and the one would get two, the oldest would get two, and then each other person would get one part. Or if there were, say, say there was, say there were nine, you know, they would divide it up into ten parts, <coughs> and the oldest would get two. So he would get double what everybody else got, but he got more, but as, as Aileen was saying, because the oldest had the responsibility to take care of any remaining, you know, parents or any, 
It wasn't just, okay, you're older, so you're just gonna be blessed. Mm -hmm. No, it was because they had responsibility with that money to take care of the family, take care of whatever. So it wasn't because God was just saying, oh boy, you're firstborn, you're top notch, and then if you're <coughs> second your child last, too bad. No, 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 there was a responsibility there for that sibling. All right, Jack, let's, go, let's move on to another example. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. All right, so second scripture basically points to the fact that if I'm serving God, all that I am and all that I have really belongs to him. And that includes my body, how I take care of this body. You know, am I abusing my body? Am I putting <clears throat> chemicals into my body that, that, that are destroying my body? Yes. Um, so all that we are belongs to him. And that's why he's talking so much about sexual immorality, because it's such a sin against our own body. And we know in the natural that people that get involved in sexual immorality, you know, sexually transmitted diseases are rampant. In our society, you don't read a lot about it because the news doesn't like to talk about that. But if you read the CDC statistics, I mean, <clears throat> it is just exponential in terms of how much, because of the of our culture today, how much you know sexual freedom has, has been propagated, and but it is wrecking havoc on our culture and people, and so it causes you know damage. God is trying to protect us from those kind of things, those damaging type of things. This is because God doesn't want us to enjoy life or have fun. Quite the contrary, he wants us to have more fun than you can have in any other way. But when we break his laws, uh, it's gonna cause problems to develop. And so we need to take care of our bodies because I'm not, ju not just a, spir I'm a spiritual being, but I have, while I'm here on the earth, I need this body. And once this body doesn't function, it doesn't matter how spiritual I am, how much Bible I know, when this body stops working, I leave. Okay? I can be spiritually mature, immature, it doesn't matter when the body stops. Mm -hmm. So I need to be careful how I take care <coughs> of this body. Am I getting enough rest? Am I obeying the Sabbath? Am I, am I taking a break you know, from, from uh, the grind of life? Am I obeying God's command? Am I taking care, um, being careful of what I eat? You know, what, 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 not so, I don't, I'm not so much consumed about how much people eat. What, what are you eating? You know, is that good for your body? You know? And um, of course, I have a friend that says, not so much <clears throat> what you eat, what's eating you. And that's true. I mean, we can, we can have things going on that I can be a health fitness nut running and only eating certain things. But if I've got greed and envy and unforgiveness, it's going to eat me alive. Okay. All right? Yes, sir. I want to say something. Damn, nothing over 20 some years. The word God brought, he brought you to Charlie and. Yeah, Mike and Darcy with well, the whole church, the Trinity though. Yeah, every day. God bless day. you because he's <clears throat> where you was at to where you're at. And today. he brought you to us. Uh, you day I look in the mirror. Every day I look in the mirror, and I'm thankful every day. You know, look at look at that handsome man in the mirror. Look no, at that. Not going too far. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that. <laughs> God did give you the fortune, man. I'm blessed. <laughs> you know, but getting at the body. Oh yeah, we take care of our our, our body that we 
our spirit is limited. But we got a body, a nation that has a body. And he wants us, <coughs> our last days, prior to our last day, to take care of where we at as where our children at. We got to take care of our surroundings. Okay. It's a mandate right now on this nation. On this nation right now is a mandate. That person that's in office, true enough, he has problems. We all do. But as a spiritual being, me, as well as y'all, yep. we have a mandate to take care of this nation. We don't have long. Everybody said we got the wrong person in office. I don't think so. No way. We have, we as Christians, this church and all other churches, got to take care of this nation's body. How we do it? The Lord has put a platform. We have a platform. We have a platform. A lot of people don't think of it. But we do have a platform. Anytime we got a platform, the Lord is the one that provided that platform. We should stand on that platform and voice, and voice our, 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 our beliefs, our, our way of life. Voice what is wrong and should be right. Voice it. These words mean life. We have a mandate right now. We're, we're steward of our culture. We're steward of right our now. Yep. That man in office, whoo, yep. he brought on a wave. He brought on a stream yep. that nobody didn't know about. Yep. It was an undercurrent. Yep. Anybody been in the ocean or in the water, you could feel that undercurrent. Oh, yeah, what is that I feel on my water. feet? Yep. You think it's a little animal or fish? No. It's an undercurrent. Man, don't remind me. I was just at the beach, so don't bring that. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? I understand. <coughs> Let's get one, Jack, one more. We won't read them all. We do, what, do the Romans at the short one. Here's one more, and then we'll, then we'll close the class. Romans 14, uh, verses 7 to 12. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Mm. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Mm. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Mm -hmm. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Pretty sobering uh, and, and a reminder that, you know, we don't, you know, in the culture people want to say, hey, I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just I'm doing my own thing. No, we, we live in community, and our actions do affect other people. And as believers, though, you know, we belong to the Lord, and our influence is wide-ranging. I, I, sometimes I get this little picture, I see this lady named Sandy, and she's walking out of church, and she's got this whole troop kids. of little kids. I mean, that, that has just burned in my mind. I see that all the time. I mean, what an influence. And I'm not trying to... Uh, not, I'm just saying, what is it? She's influencing these young people. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All of us have, have areas, spheres of influence. Right. And like Nam said, we need to use, while we're here, we need to use our influence to influence people for God's kingdom and for you know, his kingdom purposes. And all of it. You may be sitting there thinking, ah, but I don't, I don't really have, you know, I don't have. You have some area God has given you gifts and talents and abilities. And, uh, you may not have a lot of money, but maybe you have time. You know, time is precious. You right. can use your time yeah. to minister to other people. Wow, you know, she, you have a public job. You get to you yeah. get to talk to people every almost every day in your work. And they just you know, she has a captive audience. You know, I'm there. I'm like, oh, I don't want them to cut my ears. I don't want to do that. So I'm, I'm a captive audience. When I have hair, somebody's doing my hair. I'm a very captive audience, and I, um, I they talk. I, I listen. You know, it's like whatever they say because I don't I don't want them to mess up. You know, I don't want to. 
all of us have a sphere. All of us have something that God has given us. And we'll all, like I said, we'll, I'm going to give an account. So don't let the enemy tell you, oh, you don't have that much, or no, you can't, or you don't have the smarts, or you don't have the finances, or you don't have. No, we all have some area of influence and ability to influence people for the kingdom. So realize that you and I were stewards and we're alive today, and none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And that we, we want to be good stewards. Not some something well, God's some, some mean God. No, no, no. He's gift. He wants us to do well. He wants us to succeed. So don't let anybody put you down. You can succeed for the Lord. You can do far more for the Lord for eternity than the richest person on earth, or the most famous person on earth that doesn't know God. You, little you and me in, in Newark, Ohio, come as how we can influence people and things for all eternity just by being obedient. And realizing whatever I have is from God, and I want to be a good steward of all that I have. Amen. Amen. Let's, we'll pray, and I'll pass out your, your sheet for you to do. And I'll give you a class for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for <clears throat> reminding us to God that you have called us and that you are our Father, and we are your children. And Lord, we want to please you. Lord, we know how much you love us and care about us. So, Lord, continue to speak to us, continue to teach us your ways, continue to show us, Lord, how we can honor you and bless you. We want to be found faith. God, I just pray for me, myself, and for every person in this room that we'll be able to stand before you and hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To be able to hear you say, well done, uh, this is my son, this is my daughter, and who I am well pleased. That's what we want to hear, and that's what we want to do. And, uh, Lord, thank you for loving us so much and continually speaking to us and drawing us to yourself. We love you. We honor you. And we give you thanks.